So he's the commander in chief, but not the commander in chief. But he has to report to someone who's also not the commander in chief. Okay, this is getting confusing. Okay. Yeah, talk to you later. Okay, bye. March 27th, 1942. We've seen that Malta is a key, if not the key, to either side holding North Africa. But the British, who hold Malta, have been less and less able to supply it. And how can it stay in their hands without supply? What do they do? Well, they just keep trying and trying. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the British began their program of sending hydrogen balloons into Germany carrying trailing wires or explosives, intending for them to sabotage electrical grids and start forest fires. American Commander Douglas MacArthur arrived in Australia, British Commander William Slim arrived in Burma, and Chinese Nationalist Commander Chiang Kai-shek worried about the dedication and skills of his allies. There was also action, as there is every week, in the field in the Soviet Union. There is fighting there down at the Kerch Peninsula this week. As last week ended, a German counterattack began there. But though it did disrupt the Soviet preparations for their own offensive, it was called off after just a few hours, with the 22nd Panzer Division, a fresh division, losing nearly a quarter of its 142 tanks. The third Soviet offensive of the campaign begins now on the 26th, but it suffers huge losses and is called off after less than a day. Here's a general summary of the situation on the entire Eastern Front in late March 1942, courtesy of John Erickson. The multiple Soviet penetrations were deep enough and dangerous enough to trouble most of the German command. On the Volkov, Vlasov and Meretskov had managed to unlock the Second Shock Army, which stood as yet undefeated amidst the frozen bog and marsh near Lyuban. At Demyansk, the German Second Corps was undefeated but encircled like the German forces at home. East of Smolensk and west of Vyazma, Belov's 1st Cavalry, Yefremov's 33rd, 4th Parachute Corps, and strong Soviet partisan brigades were cutting and hacking at the German lines. While to the north, 11th Cavalry and 39th Army occupied the long and dangerous prominence west of Sishovka. Perkayev's 3rd Shock Army lunged out towards Veliki Luki. Yeremenko's 4th hung down over Vitebsk. Pincers stopped in mid-air, but not without their sharpness. At Kharkov, Timoshenko kept up an immense pressure, while in his great bulge over the Donets, the Soviet bridgehead was now 60 miles deep, and if Balaklaya and Slavyansk caved in, the Soviet divisions of two fronts would spill out from the massive Izium bulge. Further to the south, Manstein stood outside the gates of Sevastopol, and though he had checked a Soviet eruption into the Crimea from Kerch, he still had two Soviet armies pointed at his back. That is the situation that faces the German army as it makes plans for its spring offensives, which you will hear about sometime soon. The winter action in the field is grinding to a halt for the moment as the temperatures rise. It is a paradox of campaigning in Russia that, though winter destroyed armies, it is the coming of spring that halts operations. The thaw, saturating the suddenly unfrozen topsoil with 30 inches of snow melt, turns the dirt roads liquid and the surface of the steppe to swamp, the Rasputitsa, infernal seas of mud which clog all movement. Motorized transport buries itself above the axles in bog. Even the hardy local ponies and the light panje wagons they draw flounder in the bottomless mire. Stavka figures there are 16 million men of military age in the nation that the Red Army can be beefed up to 9 million men over the remainder of 1942. That would be enough men to fill 400 divisions and replace the 3 million lost as prisoners and the 1 million more killed so far. Over the winter, factories in the Urals produced 4,500 tanks, 3,000 planes, 14,000 big guns, and 50,000 mortars. The Germans are also expanding their forces. So far this year, the replacement army, Ersatz here, has created 22 divisions. 
women have begun to work as clerks and drivers so the men employed in those jobs can join the infantry. And volunteers have been found among the Russian prisoners to change sides and fight with the Germans rather than starve. So of the one and a half million men, German Army Chief of Staff Franz Halder estimated four weeks ago they'd lost in the USSR, 900,000 of them are made up. However, the deficiencies in armor and transport are not. By now, they lack 1,600 Mark III and Mark IV tanks, and half of the over 500,000 horses they began the campaign with last June are by now dead. But that doesn't stop them making plans. Back on the 7th, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill wired the U.S. War Department. Everything portends an immense renewal of the German invasion of Russia in the spring, and there is very little we can do to help the only country that is heavily engaged with the German armies. This sort of throws America's general war plans up in the air, which one day earlier were summed up by Admiral Ernest King as hold Hawaii, support Australia, drive north from the New Hebrides. He is very much a Pacific first kind of guy. American President Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill, though, are both worried that Soviet leader Joseph Stalin might sign a separate peace with Adolf Hitler if they can't somehow relieve the pressure on him. And this allows American Army Chief of Staff George Marshall to again try to have the war in Europe prioritized as it was a month or two ago. So last week on the 16th, the Joint Chiefs of Staff sat down with FDR to go over their options, of which they figure they have three. King sticks to his guns and wants a big offensive to drive the Japanese out of Rabaul, which would end their immediate threat to Australia, even if this means sending nothing to Europe. The Army Air Staff is for an all-out attack in Western Europe to defeat Hitler. This would involve sending no reinforcements at all to the Pacific, even if it costs them Australia, because they think that if Germany collapses, then so will Japan. Marshall put forth the compromise strategic plan worked out by Eisenhower. This was essentially the Atlantic strategy, with the allocation of limited forces to the Pacific theater sufficient only to secure Australia and Hawaii. This plan wins. They will maintain current commitments in the Pacific, and the generals even limit the number of bomber and fighter squadrons there so the Navy will not be able to attack outward from the New Hebrides. British Chief of Staff Alan Brooke thinks this is a clever move by Marshall to thwart King and contain American Commander Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur is in Melbourne, where he is evacuated from the Philippines, holding press conferences and fuming that he doesn't have a new army to command yet, and he is less than happy when it turns out there's not going to be a supreme commander to run the whole Pacific, which he figured would be him. Army-Navy rivalry has sort of precluded that. Instead, Admiral Chester Nimitz is to be commander-in-chief Pacific areas, which is west to 160 degrees and includes New Zealand, Fiji, and Samoa. MacArthur is to be Supreme Allied Commander Southwest Pacific Area to the west of that, Australia, New Guinea, etc. The British will continue to control the Indian Ocean Theater. MacArthur is even more perturbed that the Joint Chiefs will still have a lot of control. He has to report to Marshall, Nimitz to King, and any issues they have, the Joint Chiefs will resolve. I've said before that Churchill wants to win in North Africa and then invade Europe from the south. But in order for that to ever be a possibility, Malta must be held, and to be held it must be supplied. An important convoy is sent there the 20th to 23rd, but because of shipping losses and ships that are needed in the Far East, they just don't have that big of an escort force. Five light cruisers and 17 destroyers that potentially have to face the entire Italian Navy. On the 22nd, the battleship Littorio, two heavy cruisers, one light cruiser, and 10 destroyers attack the convoy in the afternoon. But despite their pretty heavy advantage, they are driven off with smoke screens and torpedoes. Still, only 5,000 tons of the 26,000 tons of fuel in the convoy makes it to land on Malta because of German and Italian air attacks. The British are also having problems with supplies and aerial attacks in Burma. The fall of Rangoon two weeks ago 
had serious repercussions. It really did provide supplies for the whole country. And of course, the fall of the south of the country meant the Japanese controlled the best airfields. And the Allies cannot now get any new planes or crews through Rangoon. Their radar equipment, their code breaking stuff has all been taken to India. So Magwe Base, which they've been using since, has literally no early warning system of incoming enemy. By now in Burma, the RAF and the American Volunteer Group in the Chinese Army have 38 planes left. The Japanese have 271. On the 21st, 151 bombers hit Magwe and destroy 15 planes for a cost of two. By the 23rd, the AVG is down to four planes and evacuates to Loi Wing across the Chinese border. By the 27th, the RAF has evacuated Burma as well. On the ground this week in Burma, on the 24th, Taungu is attacked. Now, the 200th Division of the Chinese 5th Army are the best troops the Chinese have in Burma. They are 8,500 men strong and mechanized, though their tankettes and light armored vehicles are no match for Japanese light and medium tanks. Their general, An Lan Tai, sets up a perimeter around Taungu, but the Japanese 55th Division pounds away at his positions on the west bank of the Sitang River with artillery. The Japanese 56 reaches the area, parks its motors, and crosses the river, closing in on the bridge across the river and threatening to surround the Chinese 200th. The fighting is brutal for the remainder of the week. A week of fighting in Burma, fighting in the Crimea, and the Allies, well, the Americans, still figuring out who they will focus on first, the Japanese or the Germans. You know, a lot changed in December 1941 with the entry of the U.S. into the war and the German army stopped before reaching Moscow. The main forces that opposed the Axis, the U.S., Britain, the USSR, the Chinese, the Free French, control over 80% of the Earth's raw materials. The U.S. alone produces two-thirds of the world's oil and generates a third of the world's electricity. The industrial production of the world in 1937 was at about a value of $145 billion. $52 billion of that, or 36%, is American. 17.5, or 12%, is German. These numbers are from Germany and the Second World War, Volume 6, by the way. Since they have access to the whole North American continent, the U.S. has pretty much unlimited raw materials. Well, nearly so at any rate. And things like rubber, they'll sort out synthetically. Germany is short of most things except coal. But even if all things were equal, the U.S. has one massive advantage that Germany does not. Its economy is immune to physical attack from the enemy. There's all that, and also that the USSR, mainly without any Allied help since supplies were only just starting to arrive, survived. It had maintained its existence and independence from the Western Allies, and that it had thereby laid the foundation stone for its rise to great power status. It was no longer to be excluded from Allied considerations of the future world order. That's another huge deal. During things like like the Atlantic Charter Conference last year, the Allies assumed the USSR would fall and Germany would gain dominance of all of mainland Europe. So the peace envisioned by the Charter is no longer really viable and they're gonna have to get used to that. For Joseph Stalin, when the US joined the war, the capitalist side of the war against Hitler was suddenly a bunch stronger than the socialist side. And he's very concerned how that might play out in a post-war world. But they all have to get along now, and they're all suspicious of ulterior motives. Antony Eden, who met with Stalin in December, thinks that the USSR's 1941 boundaries, except those with Poland, but which include the Baltic states, be recognized as official. And in return, Britain would be involved in Polish-Soviet border talks, and they would cooperate in reconstructing Europe with the Soviets and have confederations in the Balkans and Central Europe. The British figured the Americans would reject this, which they did, but the British War Cabinet approved this. Well, there's a lot more to all this, a lot, which I'll cover in detail eventually. But what I'm getting at here is going back to the change in war plans I mentioned that happened back on the 7th. Churchill also wrote to Roosevelt that day. 
the increasing gravity of the war led me to feel that the principles of the Atlantic Charter ought not to be constructed so as to deny Russia the frontier she occupied when the Germans attacked her. Two observations. Modern war makes very strange bedfellows, and security often trumps principle in modern war. While the Second World War may have made strange bedfellows, this won't be the case forever. If you want to watch a series where the USA and the Soviet Union are at each other's throats, you can do so over on our Time Goes History channel with our mini-series on the Cuban Missile Crisis, which is right here sometime soon. Covers it day by day as it happened. Really cool. Our Time Ghost Army Member of the Week is Andreas Kvalvik. It's thanks to Time Ghost Army Members like Andreas that everything we make is possible. And you can join them in supporting us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.